All right, so good morning, Daryl Baskin here. We're gonna do ocular involvement in AIDS. So what I did with this lecture is, there's a lot of overlap between this lecture and your posterior uvi lecture that you'll get already or you're about to get. Um, I gave that lecture last year and it's on YouTube. So I really don't dive into those details because they're somewhat redundant. Um, don't have any financial conflicts of interest that I'm aware of. So, Chris, do you want to describe this photo for me? Sure. Uh, yeah. Color from this photo uh, of the left eye. The eye he appears clear. This is my nice char. Uh, normal caliber, coarse caliber of the vessels. There, you know, your attention is drawn to the superior macula uh, of this area of, of you know, kind of semi congruent whitening. Good. Yep. So you get some whitening up there. And uh, we're talking about AIDS, so do you want to guess what this might be? Um, it doesn't look like it doesn't look like the, you know what I want to say, which is like a CMV retinitis. Right, that's what you want to say, but there's actually a more common finding in AIDS patients than CMV retinitis in terms of a retinal finding. This is the most common one. Um, this happens in seventy percent. And, and it's HIV retinopathy. Okay. So they get cotton wool spots, microaneurysms, kind of, and never quite looks like diabetes, but it's on that sort of spectrum of vasculopathy. Um, they can get little hemorrhages, and it's thought that, that HIV endothelial, endothelial, the endothelial cells get infected by HIV, and they don't work as well, and so you get that same kind of capillary occlusion, is, leukocyte adhesion. Like mean, yeah, there's basically a bunch of cotton wool spots right there. Yeah. All together. Yeah. yeah, and you might say, well, could that be a BRAO or... It's really not in the distribution of one. It really kind of is fluffy and kind of goes beyond several sort of watershed areas of, of those vessels. And it kind of extends from that venule down almost to the fovea, really. Mm -hmm. I had the next, the, I originally had a slide of the follow-up like two months later where it just kind of looks depressed and you lose that kind of sheen of the nerve fiber layer, but for whatever reason, I don't it's have that photo. have a, a lot of cotton wool spots and not very many hemorrhages. Yes, but not. they don't even get a lot. It's pretty underwhelming. You see like a few little cotton wool spots. Um, and so it's, it's a good point that when you see a cotton wool spot, you really want to find out why it's there. It's not normal to have a cotton wool spot just lingering in an eyeball. So this is what you, want, this is what you said. And so CMV retinitis is the most common opportunistic infection in patients with AIDS. And there are three different varieties. There's a whole lecture that kind of goes into viral retinitis. But... Um, that's the more fulminant case. This is uh, a case I had, uh, goodness, two years ago maybe, um, someone from Guam that came in and she actually did not have AIDS, but she was immunosuppressed. And uh, so this is that sort of more indolent course that's that um, granular peripheral one. And actually the color photos were not that impressive. It was very underwhelming, but here on the auto, excuse me, the FA, it, it's, it's much more impressive. Um, so I want to talk about immune recovery uveitis, and actually I didn't know a whole lot about this. Um, I, in fact, I'm, I learned a little bit from Dan Johnson when I, when I was a resident, so I just decided to put this lecture together as a bunch of questions, so you three are very lucky. <laughs> and we'll just kind of go around, so uh, Aaron, you can do the first one. Okay, so it, before we get to the uveitis portion, have you ever heard of the term immune recovery, and do you know that it actually has a definition? Before I read the UBI book, no, I did not know. Well, that if, if, if you know what our definition is, you're welcome to say it. If not, I'll go on to the answer. <laughs> so I believe that it is uh, CD40 counts that increase, that are depressed and that decrease above 200. So, so you're... So they've been below 50 and then... Right, so increase. basically we're talking about people that have, you know, age-defining illnesses, that sort of thing. Their CD4 is below 200. But then in this case, they talk about you, you actually recover at least 50 cells per microliter, and that has to hit an absolute minimum of 100. So if you meet those two criteria, then we can maybe say that this is immune recovery. And um, then we talk about, so what, what, do you, what are the preconditions? Can anybody get immune recovery uveitis? We'll go to Tamana. Or, in other words, so yeah, you, you, so you have get... have to be immunocompromised first. Right, right. It, it's a very specific term for AIDS, actually. And, and I'm sure it could apply to a few other things out there, but we'll kind of leave it in the context of HIV and AIDS. And so we already said they had to increase their cells to by 50 at least. They had to get up to at least 100. And then what else? So let's, 
what else would you look for in a patient's history to say, oh yeah, we're, we're concerned about immune recovery uveitis? Do they need to have a history of another infection before they can get to IRU? Yes. And that infection is? CMV. Yes, CMV retinitis. And so that's basically it. Immune recovery and a history of CMV retinitis, the, that's where we were concerned. If they had toxoplasmosis, if they had HIV retinopathy, and they had immune recovery, that wouldn't necessarily mean they're going to get IRU. So what are the manifestations of IRU, Dr. Rodriguez? Uh, right, this is good This is good because we need to know this stuff because we, at some point, I know we're in the military now, we're not always going to be in the military. Well, we are going to see some folks that aren't on heart. And uh, so the manifestations are anterior or intermediate uveitis. So it's as simple as that. You don't get like the original CMV retinitis again. You're, we're talking about, you know, somebody with an iritis, basically, or a little intermediate uveitis. So since you guys know about as much about this as I knew about it before I put this lecture together, I'll go ahead and tell you what the two main risk factors are for IRU unless you want to volunteer. Okay. So... If you have a greater than 25% surface area with CMV retinitis in the past, or if you use Sidofovir. So um, those are the two big risk factors. And see why I put this as questions? Because now we're, maybe our brains are stimulated a little bit more. Seven, Otherwise, that's the odds ratio. So if you, uh, if you use Sidofovir, you're 10 times more likely. For whatever reason, again, didn't, didn't go into the details or look up their references. It's just from the book. Um, so intravitreal steroids must not be used, true or false? I heard it true. All right, good. And true or false, IRU has not been linked to continuation or discontinuation of anti-CMV medication. It's true, actually. So uh, you stop it, you know, basically, in other words, if you're treating somebody with CMV right nice and then you stop their medication because eventually you have to stop it, uh, that doesn't necessarily mean they're going to get IRU. So, or if you start it, so, or continue it. In other words, IRU is sort of this independent thing. You, they, they get on heart, they start to do better and then they might get immune recovery uveitis. And uh, let's see. And it's also some, the severity is somewhat proportional to the surface area involved. It's not a high proportion of people that get IRU. So this is the fog in the headlight kind of picture, right? So what are we thinking? Toxoplasmosis, hyperpigmented scar, right? maybe some subretinal fluid, some definitely some retinal whitening, retinitis, and some botrytis. Okay. We're not going to go into toxoplasmosis and why cats are evil, um, like I usually go into. Uh, I, it really was hard for me to skip those slides last night. I thought, I'm not going to get on my soapbox. Okay, but let's talk about why, when we treat people with toxoplasmosis, because by the way, there's not a lot of level one evidence to suggest that these people do different with our traditional therapies. In other words, not always different than the natural history of the disease. So this is, this is a slide from the, my typical lecture. Moderate to severe vitreous inflammation, I'll, that makes me want to treat them. Lesions in the macular next to the optic nerve, makes sense. Immunocompromised, we'll go into that in just a moment, a little bit more. Neonates, especially because of systemic uh, infection issues. And pregnant women with acquired disease, but you have to be careful how you treat them. Persistence of disease for greater than a month. Persistence of multiple active lesions. Decreased visual acuity. For whatever reason, I have not seen many of these since I came back from fellowship. I saw a lot in fellowship. And maybe since I said that more will come in, I welcome that. Um, so these are all kind of relative indications. And let's talk about specifically the classic regimen that we all learn about triple therapy. Uh, let's see, Dr. Hager, um, do you remember what triple therapy is? Pyrimethamine sulfur, uh, what is it? Some azine. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And something you, You're saying folinic acid, right? Yeah. I, he I heard yeah. the F. So that's your that's a classic regimen. I, you know, there there's a study where we pulled a bunch of uveitis specialists, and more of them use this than not. But the evidence suggests that, and even they admitted, the monotherapies work pretty well. Now, Bactrim DS has been used for a long time as a monotherapy, and that again work meaning work as well as the other thing that doesn't work that well. But clindamycin uh, is being used a little bit more, and then intravitreal clindamycin is being used uh, even even more since we're doing tons of injections anyway. Um, it's easier to talk somebody into something that we do fairly routinely. Okay, intravitreal canalog, subtenons canalog, that's a big no-no. Uh, but we do start systemic steroids after 24 to 48 hours of antimicrobial therapy. So I want to give you a picture from Army Harper. Uh, he, he gave me these slides. And this is a kid that came in. This is a optos color, which is really not a color funnest photo at all. Anyway, we're looking at two wavelengths of light that we smashed together, red and green. 
and we come up with this really ugly photo. Anyway, so what you see is this scar and a couple little white dots there, and you go, well, that's interesting. Patient's vision's down. I don't remember what it is. We'll see if I have it in a slide up here. You could see that hypofluorescence on FA, and let's see if the next thing's going to pop up. Here's his OCT. Did not guess it was going to look like that based on that ugly color, uh, pseudo color photo that we saw, right? I mean, that's why I don't like those. But um, I like the I like them for autofluorescence and FA, and I like the fact that they do wide field. But for a color, nothing really beats our typical, our regular color fundus photos that we get. So anyway, all that subretinal fluid, he treated with intraventrial uh, clindamycin, and that's how he looked, uh, I don't know, we'll say a month later, maybe less than that. So totally flattened out. So that's obviously pretty convincing. Uh, to me anyway, because that is dif definitely different. It, it resolved a lot faster than natural history. You don't want to base all of your treatment off of one case, of course. Okay, so let's talk about how Toxo is different comparing it between a person with HIV, AIDS, and somebody who's immunocompetent. So, which one has larger lesions? Uh, Tamana. Right. A third of HIV, AIDS, toxo lesions are greater than five dyscaria in size. And what's our next question? Bi which one's more likely to be bilateral? Well, this is kind of a trick question because the book says 40% for HIV, AIDS, but then if you look at the immunocompetent folks, there's like the congenital. So there's been this big thing about congenital versus acquired. And what we found out from the studies in Ericum, I think that's how you say it, in Brazil, uh, there are some ophthalmologists, like a whole dynasty of ophthalmologists that uh, work down there, and they've basically shown that lots of people uh, that show up with it, uh, it looks like it's acquired more than we thought it was. So anyway, so it used to be like a lot of the congenital ones, we'd say a lot of them are bilateral, maybe even more than HIV AIDS, but now, uh, anyway, so we'll just say jury's out. Uh, greater vitritis, Chris. Uh, I'm going to actually say immunocompetent. Good. That's right. And presence of old chororetinal scars. Immunocompetence. Right. And do I have another question? Yes. Prognosis. Which one's got the better prognosis? Immunocompetence. Right. And so the way to think about this is the vitritis kind of fits with who has a lot of white cells to begin with, not the HIV AIDS person. And then if you don't have a lot of, an, a, I, this is the way I think of it, immune response to kind of keep it self-limited, it, they're going to be bigger lesions. Why they don't have pre-existing retinal scars is probably because uh, they they just got exposed to it and now it's it's happening and who knows. Okay, so uh, that one's not quite as intuitive. So I will also consider the possibility of existing cerebral or disseminated toxoplasmosis in an HIV AIDS patient and may, that might make me more likely to give them systemic treatment. But then you also have to think about uh, bone marrow toxicity and things like that. So uh, you just got to be careful. So pyrimethamine and sulfadiazine can do bad things to the bone marrow. So we're going to kind of switch gears to ocular syphilis and HIV AIDS. So the book has this one sentence, so I thought I would throw it in here. What's the classic ocular presentation of syphilis and HIV AIDS? <laughs> I never really thought of this as being classic, but um, I certainly agree that I've seen it, and I haven't seen a whole lot of cases. Right, I know. It's that. It, <laughs> what what did they say? It's that. Um, uh, it's the great masquerader, and then they've got this other word for it that I'm I'm blanking on right now. But is it the iris gumas? That does happen. That's not what was in the book. Oh, yeah, the classic one in the book was the acute syphilitic posterior placoid chorioretinitis. Yeah, so that's the it's one we've actually. Right? It's, it's not pathognomonic. It says classic, but I've seen it in folks that haven't had uh, immunocom. It compromised status, um, but I certainly have seen it in a lot of immunocompromised patients that have syphilis. Anyway, true false, uh, syphilis and HIV AIDS may present as a dense vitreous without choreoretinitis. True. Yep, true. All right, next subject, protean. That was the word I was looking for. It has protean manifestations in the Greek character. Okay, so multifocal choroiditis and HIV AIDS, this might be the most helpful thing to me that I learned is putting this chapter together. Again, I don't have a whole lot of experience with this topic, just thanks to Heart as a highly active antiretroviral therapy, and you guys are probably in the same category as me. Um, but if you see somebody who's got this sort of multifocal choroiditis, uh, you, you, there's a decent differential here, but there's also a workup that needs to be done because these uh, infections can be disseminated and can be in the brain and can kill the patient, 
And there was a um, one uh, abstract that I looked at from Narsim Rao where they did a bunch of autopsy studies and they found that several several of the cases had an infection in the eye that was manifesting as a choroiditis. Again, they're looking at autopsy sections. But that that was a representation that was going on systemically that actually killed them and it hadn't been identified pre-death. So um, anybody know what one of the four things that can cause a multifocal choroiditis in HIV AIDS patient is? Right, that's two of them. And so tuberculosis, mycobacterium tuberculosis is an atypical mycobacteria, which I guess isn't really TB, but it's close. And then there's two others. One is pneumocystis yurovetsi choroiditis, which wasn't that when I was a medical student. It used to be PCP or pneumocystis crinii. Uh, I love to date myself. Uh, well, I like it when I date my wife, I guess. Date myself by being older. Anyway, M t TB, and then there's one more. Anybody remember? Cryptococcus. So, um, see if there's anything else I wanted to mention before we go on. So, you want to do an exhaustive workup, see if you could find, uh, because the cord's basically this place where a lot of infections will sort of congregate in the immunocompromised. Okay, so what is the incidence of multifocal choroiditis in a patient with AIDS? It's pretty low, it's 10%. So I'll show you a couple more questions and then a couple of pictures and then we'll switch over, switch gears to the next lecture. What are the FA findings on a patient with a PCP, pneumocystis, urovetsi, choroiditis? Um, it's the classic blocks early stains late. And if pneumocystis, urovetsi, choroiditis is suspected, what should you do? I don't expect anybody to know this. Uh, you need to basically call an internist, but you want to do a chest x-ray. This is listed in, our, in the book. I mean, as if we're going to be do, getting an arterial blood, gl blood gas on somebody. <laughs> LFTs, abdominal CT scan, but you, again, you should include the, 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 your friends. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's where I'd stop, too. Okay. Um, cryptococcus, most common cause of fungal meningitis in HIV AIDS. Most frequent fungal eye infection in HIV AIDS. Again, I, I think the book kind of contradicts itself a few times, but it seems to be that this is more common than candida, whereas the book kind of re reverses its, it, it kind of, it just contradicts itself. So uh, papilledema is more common than choroidal involvement. Again, you want to think about that CNS component, and they can get optic nerve atrophy to that, and you want to treat it promptly. And there's some pictures of it. They don't think they had any pictures in the book, or they weren't that good, so there's some there. And then we're getting outside of the retina just for a couple of moments. Kaposi sarcoma, you get two varieties, right? You get that endemic one that's in Kenya, Nigeria, classically, probably in other countries besides those. And then the epidemic variety, which was associated with immunosuppression, 30% of AIDS patients have it. It's associated with HHV8, human herpes virus 8. Uh, and basically, you want to think about that visceral dissemination, GI tract, lungs, liver, and then also think about uh, treatment for these, excision cryotherapy, radiation, which I haven't seen, or, some, or a little bit of both. Molluscum in an HIV AIDS patient tend to be more likely to bilateral, be bilateral and have conjunctivitis. And that's it for this little lecturette, again, 10-page chapter. And we'll go ahead and stop there and go on to our next.